I'm Rick Wilson, the director of Ciencia, and I'd like to thank you for attending today's uh, lecture. Uh, this year's series is entitled Panoply. I take the meaning to be a broad tapestry of talent. Uh, the aim of this series is to showcase the many different streams of research uh, here at uh, Rice. Uh, Ciencia members hope that this is going to help foster um, cross-school fertilization. Today's topic is apocalypse, and what better topic for this day and age, uh, especially if you're in DC these days. Uh, whereas the original meaning of apocalypse uh, simply is an uncovering or a revelation, uh, in common parlance today, apocalypse uh, has become synonymous with the expectation of an end of time catastrophe. Our spe first speaker today is going to be Matthias Henze from the Department of Religion. He earned his Master's of Divinity from the University of Heidelberg in Germany in 1992, earned his PhD in, uh, from Harvard in 1997, and joined the Rice faculty at about that time. Uh, his areas of interest include the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, Jewish literature, and thought at the time of the Second Temple, apocalyptic literature, and the Quran fragments. Our second speaker uh, is Scott Solomon, uh, an associate uh, teaching professor at Rice University in the Biosciences. He earned his uh, PhD in ecology, and evolution, uh, ecology, evolution, and behavior in uh, 2007 from the University of Texas. He's been at Rice since 2009 and has been quite active in the Center for Teaching Excellence, among other things. His research focuses on ant colonies and the effect of apocalyptic flooding events. Uh, he's a wonderful science communicator. Our third speaker is Moshe Vardy, a university professor, uh, the Karen Ostrom George Distinguished Service Professor of Computational Engineering, and the director of the Ken Kennedy Institute for Information Technology here at Rice. Not anymore, that's true. It's free at last, free at last, yes. Uh, he has won innumerable uh, awards, published over 600 papers, and is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Science, the European Academy of Sciences, and the Academia Europa. But we all know him as our own Moshe. Uh, now, these three talks are going to discuss very different contemporary ap apocalyptic visions. Uh, Matthias will discuss the nature of apocalyptic beliefs in modern American evangelicalism and how President Trump effectively taps into popular end time speculations. Scott Solomon will discuss the ecological demise due to climate change and environmental de de degradation and Moshe will speak about the, the diminution of humanity because of the development of super intelligent machines. This promises to be fun, <laughs> or maybe the end times. <laughs> Good afternoon. So people kept asking me, when is the apocalypse? And I said, October 8th at 4 in McMurtry <laughs> Auditorium. So I'm glad we all made it. Let me start out by thanking Rick for the very kind invitation um, to present to you briefly. I also would like to thank Scott and Moshe, my fellow end time enthusiasts. If they don't ruin your day, you're not paying attention. You're in for a real treat. So. The word apocalypse, where does it come from and what does it actually mean? The answer is it comes from the New Testament and particularly from the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, which starts out, and here we're brushing up on your Greek, Apocalypse, uh, Apocalypsis Jesu Christu, which means something like the Apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, which is the title of the book. And then you go to a Greek dictionary and you look up the Greek word apocalypsis and there you find the first meaning is discovery of hidden things or revelation. And then you look up the verb apocalypto in Greek, which simply means to uncover, to unveil, to reveal. So I'd like to make two points right at the outset of our three talks. The first one is that the word apocalypse comes into our vocabulary from the New Testament and it was adopted by Protestant theologians to describe a certain kind of ancient Jewish and Christian literature. And my second point is that originally, in its origin, the word apocalypse really means only the revelation of certain knowledges, something that God discloses to some people, a kind of knowledge that otherwise would be inaccessible to us, 
but it doesn't really carry with it any notion of catastrophe or nightmares about the destruction of the world, which is very much how we understand it today. Apocalyptic ideas then began to develop in ancient Israel, beginning the third century BCE all the way to the first century of the Common Era, over a span of about 400 years. That's what I do in my professional life. I won't bore you with it today. I'm interested in a very different area, namely how these apocalyptic ideas play themselves out in the contemporary United States and especially in American evangelical Christianity. So let me explain to you what I mean. Let me give you a thumbnail description of when I refer to evangelicals, whom I have in mind. Here I'm talking about Christians that are increasingly inter or non-denominational, who emphasize the centrality of the Bible, the necessity of individual conversions, something that evangelicals like to refer to as born again in Christ, and who tend to be activists, by which I mean that they are politically savvy and they are interested in proselytizing. So let me give you an example. On September 23rd, 1949, President Harry Truman announced to the world that the Soviet Union had conducted a successful test of an atomic bomb. A couple of days later, a young preacher by the name of Billy Graham had this to say. I think we're living at a time in world history when God is giving us a choice, a choice of either revival or judgment. There is no alternative. God Almighty is going to bring judgment upon the city unless people repent and believe, unless God sends an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, Holy Ghost revival. Across Europe, at this very hour, there is stark naked fear among the people, for we all realize that war is much closer than we ever dreamed. Russia is now ex has now exploded an atomic bomb. An arms race is driving us madly towards destruction. I am persuaded that time is desperately short. Graham's is hardly the only post-war evangelical expression of apocalyptic urgency. The civil rights movement, Vietnam, the Cold War, and the oil crisis in the 1970s all inspired visions of unprecedented disaster and doom. One of the better known examples is Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, first published in 1970 and, according to the New York Times, number one nonfiction bestseller of the decade. Uh, to date, there are about 20 million copies sold, slightly more than my dissertation, I confess. <laughs> Lindsay describes what will happen in the short time that remains until the second advent or the return of Jesus. The key ingredients in what he calls his biblical prophecy are all alive and well today in evangelical Christianity a great sense of urgency, a concern about the global influence of the USSR and China, a fascination with the state of Israel, and the anticipation that major Muslim sites, and particularly the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, will soon be destroyed. Other books followed, most famously perhaps the Left Behind series. Today, the internet is filled with end time literature, with sci-fi literature and cli-fi or climate fiction literature. In 2014, the Pew Research Center found that 31% of all Texans consider themselves evangelicals, forming the largest block of religious voters. In, two, in the 2016 election, President Trump carried 85% of the evangelical vote, which is higher than the national evangelical average of 81%. This love affair between President Trump and evangelicals has always been a bit of a mystery. The president is married for the third time, frequently talks in vulgarities, is plagued by multiple sex scandals, calls white supremacists who shout anti-Semitic slogans good people, and by just about any measure, hates the poor, none of which is a particular Christian virtue. And yet, 
President Trump managed to win and to maintain the steadfast moral support of America's value voters. So how exactly can this be explained? I'd like to suggest to you that there are five reasons why evangelicals support President Trump. First, access to the President of the United States. President Trump formed an evangelical advisory board. I'm not making this up. Google it, you'll find it, an evangelical advisory board. For evangelicals, the election of Donald Trump came 50 years um, after 50 years of increasing disillusionment that nothing in Washington was going to change in their favor. In President Trump, they have a strong supporter. So here's my first homework assignment for you. Go on Netflix and watch the documentary, The Family. It's all about conservative Christian influence in uh, Washington, D.C., just in case you think that I'm exaggerating. Second, evangelicals have long felt bullied by the left. They believe that liberal Christians and secularists, probably 80% of the people in this room, just a guess, are hostile to the very culture that they have built. In President Trump, they have found somebody who is fighting back hard. So here's a quote from Pastor Robert Jeffries of Dallas's First Baptist Church. I have to back Trump because we are in the middle of a war for our country, unquote. Trump's favorite verse in the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Three, American culture is hardly trending towards evangelical beliefs. There's approval of same-sex marriage, support for legal abortion, and religious affiliation is dropping quickly. The overall picture is pretty bleak for evangelicals, much like the picture that President Trump painted during his speech at the Republican National Convention, which I also thought was rather bleak. Abortion is a huge issue for evangelicals. Then there are President Trump's Supreme Court nominations, of which most evangelicals approve. It turns out that conservative political values and evangelical values are not that far apart, regardless of whether or not you believe in the second advent of Jesus. Four, an obsession with the modern state of Israel. President Trump and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu work pretty well together. President Trump has relocated the embassy, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which all previous U.S. presidents had promised during the election and none had done. Evangelicals have their own form of philo-Semitism, of love for the Jews. They need the modern state of Israel, so they have easy access to Jerusalem and to all other holy sites of Christianity. One particularly outspoken figure in this is Pastor John Hagee of Cornerstone Church down the street in San Antonio. He is the founder of a group called Christians United for Israel. So here's my second homework assignment for you. Pastor Hagee was asked to give the benediction when the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem was inaugurated. So go on YouTube and watch his benediction. It basically is a, a summary of my talk here. And five, the protection of the environment is not really a concern. If the prophet Isaiah says that God will make a new heaven and a new earth, why take care of this one? This is really not so different from President Trump's insistence that climate change is a Chinese hoax. So what does all of this have to do with apocalyptic beliefs? My thesis is that once we understand that the apocalyptic worldview consists of more than fire and brimstone, then we will recognize that the apocalypse is a major factor in evangelical thinking. And here I just list three points I could add more. One, the sense of urgency. Time is running out. The end is nigh. There is no time left for endless academic deliberations. Bad news for our religion department. Time is now to act, to convert, to get ready. In the words of Billy Graham that I just read to you a few minutes ago, I am persuaded that time is desperately short. Second, the apocalyptic worldview is fundamentally dualistic. They're the sons of light, 
and the sons of darkness. There is good, there is evil, there is this world and the worlds to come. There is us versus them. Today we call this partisanship. Loyalty to one's own group overrides any personal qualms you might have. It's really important, this sense of partisanship and loyalty to one's own group. And third, there's this focus on Israel and particularly on Jerusalem as the place of Jesus' return, return. Excuse me. Whereas American evangelicals tend to be philo-Semites, meaning they're a very one-sided uh, pro-Israel, backing Trump and Netanyahu, most mainline Christians, both here and particularly in Europe, tend to be very critical of the modern state of Israel and its policies and tend to support the Palestinians. So you might think that I'm making all of this up or that this is a little overdrawn. So my second to last slide is that I want to share with you a tweet. Less than a month ago, President Trump approvingly retweeted the words of an American radio host and conspiracy theorist, Wayne Allen Root. So President Trump tweeted, thank you to Wayne Allen Root for the very nice words. President Trump is the greatest president for Jews and for Israel in the history of the world, not just for America. He is the best president for Israel in the history of the world. And the Jewish people in Israel love him, like he is the king of Israel. They love him like he is the second coming of God. This is the modern American apocalypse. So I leave you with this concluding thought. A colleague, Kathleen Sands, um, published earlier this year with Yale University Press a book titled America's Religious Wars, The Embattled Heart of Our Public Life. And in it, she describes what she calls the long-standing conflict between anti-modernist religion and anti-religious modernism. And I think this is extremely helpful. I think this is exactly what we're seeing here, a clash of a particular form of conservative Christianity with strong apocalyptic leanings with a modern, or perhaps better said, postmodern society. President Trump takes full advantage of this ongoing conflict and yet again succeeds brilliantly in making it work to his advantage. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matthias. That was a fantastic way to start us off and now for something completely different. Well, if you've been reading the headlines lately, you might assume that we're already in the midst of what you might call an ecological apocalypse. This summer, the world watched in horror as fires raged across large parts of the Amazon rainforest. The loss of Amazonian forests has global implications. Amazonian rainforest trees absorb about 2 billion tons of carbon every year as they grow. Burning them releases that carbon back into the atmosphere. Estimates suggest that roughly one-fourth of all species on Earth live in the Amazon rainforest. There's at least 14,000 species of plants, 1,500 types of birds, and more than 400 types of mammals. A single Amazonian tree can be home to as many as 43 different types of ants. Now, new species are being discovered each year. In a study that my colleagues and I published last month, we found four new species of Amazonian ants. But the pace of discovery can't keep up with the rate at which these forests are disappearing. I actually did my dissertation research in the Amazon, and I know the area pretty well. Now, these fires aren't a new phenomenon, but the scale of burning in the last year should be cause for alarm for all of us. I was actually just in the Peruvian Amazon a few weeks ago. And luckily, we didn't see any fires in the immediate vicinity of, of where we were. Uh, but I was really struck by how disturbed the forests were nevertheless. And that was true even in federally protected areas. Interestingly, some of the best preserved forests that we saw were in areas that were preserved by local communities, which is encouraging 
Unfortunately, the scale at which they can do so is, uh, is not nearly enough. Now, the fires should be a major concern, and they're actually still burning right now as we speak. <clears throat> but as uh, my recent trip indicates, these forests face a wide range of threats. Coral reefs are in danger of disappearing within our lifetimes. These corals continue to experience bleaching and death as sea temperatures rise, and they face other threats like nutrient pollution from fertilizer runoff and ocean acidification. While coral reefs make up less than 1% of the total surface of the seafloor around the world, they're home to about 25% of all marine species, and they directly provide more than $30 billion to the global economy. Birds are among the best studied animals, and we actually have really good data on the abundance and distribution of birds, particularly in North America. There was a recent study that analyzed observation data over the last 48 years and concluded that there's about 3 billion fewer birds today in North America than there were in 1970. That's a 29% reduction in the population across all species. And the ones that were particularly hardest hit are actually those that live in grassland ecosystems, which is what Houston used to be. And the causes for these declines are, are well understood, and there are many of them. Factors include things like habitat loss, uh, but also the use of pesticides, which can kill birds directly or indirectly, for example, by killing their, their prey. Also, the proliferation of outdoor cats is a big problem for birds, as is light pollution, which can affect migratory birds. And while the decline in bird populations <clears throat> is certainly alarming, we're often less aware of declines in less charismatic species. Insects are experiencing steep declines as well. And you may have already actually noticed this if you've been on a road trip recently. It used to be you take a road trip and you have to stop periodically to clean off your windshield because of all the bugs that would accumulate there. A lot of people report that that's becoming less and less the case these days. And while that's anecdotal, there's actually quantitative studies that support that uh, this decline is in fact real. A study in Germany tracked flying insects using the same type of trap over the last 27 years. And they did this over 63 different protected areas. They found a decline of 76% in the biomass of those insects. A study in Ohio recently found a 33% reduction over 10 years in butterfly abundances. And many other similar studies exist as well. These declining insect populations really should be a red flag. Insects are actually the most diverse group of organisms alive. More than half of all described species are insects and insects make up about 75% of all animal species. Insects play important roles in all terrestrial ecosystems, including serving as pollinators, as waste recyclers, seed dispersers, prey for other animal animals, and lots of other important roles. Speaking of pollinators, 90% of all wild flowering plants depend on some kind of animal pollinator, and most of them are insects. That it also includes, though, hummingbirds and bats. 75% of our food crops depend on animal pollinators as well. Now, there are a few high-profile insects like honeybees whose declining populations do tend to get some attention, but these are really just the tip of the iceberg. Now, honeybees are an example of a managed pollinator. And these uh, honeybees certainly do play important roles as pollinators for a lot of our crop plants. But the vast majority of pollinators are actually wild insects. We don't have good data on many wild insect populations, especially for the most of the world. But we do have some data for North America and Western Europe. And in those places where people have looked, they've found declining populations of wild pollinators. In other words, what we're facing is a biodiversity crisis. A report released this May 
by the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services concluded that roughly one million species currently face extinction. Mammals and other vertebrates are especially vulnerable. In the case of mammals, many species are being targeted for their meat or for other valuable body parts like horns, tusks. <clears throat> Frogs and other amphibians have they've experienced some of the, de uh, the steepest declines, and that's in part because they're um, susceptible to the spread of a parasitic fungus known as chytrid fungi. But their situation is made much worse by habitat destruction and declining water quality. These reports and others have prompted some researchers to suggest that we're currently on the brink of the sixth major mass extinction event in the history of the Earth, on par with the previous five, the last of which happened 66 million years ago and of course included the extinction of the dinosaurs. The world is becoming less biologically diverse. This is alarming on many levels. For one thing, we have the notion of what E.O. Wilson described as biophilia, the innate attraction that we all have as humans for nature. It's the reason why we keep pets, the reason why a walk in the woods can lower your blood pressure and alleviate anxiety, it may even be the reason why we consider real estate with a water view to be more valuable. But there's also a more tangible threat. We depend on the ecosystem services provided by intact natural ecosystems for our survival. I think we all understand this intuitively, but that the, the destruction of natural ecosystems, it does pose a threat to humanity. But what do we actually know about the consequences of biodiversity loss? Well, it turns out that ecologists have actually been studying this for years. One of the pioneering studies was done by Bob Payne in the 1960s. He did a simple experiment in which he removed Pisaster sea stars from tide pools along the Washington coastline and then observed what happens next. Now, these sea stars are predators. So if you remove them, what do you think happens? I usually make my students, you know, raise their hands, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you guys a pass this time. Well, interestingly, if you compare the areas without the Pisaster sea stars to those where he left the Pisaster sea stars, what you see is a dramatic reduction in the total number of species in areas without the sea stars. And this is somewhat counterintuitive because these are predators. They eat things, right? But what was happening here is that the predators kept the populations of other species, like mussels, in check. And that prevented any one mussel species from outcompeting all the others. So this is actually the study that gave us the concept of a keystone species. So in architecture, a keystone is the one piece of stone at the top of the arch that holds the entire arch together, right? If you remove that one stone, the arch collapses. Similarly, if you remove any one keystone species from an ecosystem, the entire ecosystem collapses. And since these pioneering studies, we've seen similar effects in many other ecosystems where we've looked. I'll give you just a few examples here. Yellowstone, the reintroduction of wolves where they once had proliferated. Once those wolves were reintroduced to an ecosystem where they, they really belonged, it actually led to a reduction in the populations of herbivores that are their prey. And because there were fewer herbivores, it allowed vegetation to recover, as you can see in the bottom left picture. Similarly, the island of Guam, birds became locally extinct because of the accidental introduction of the brown tree snake, a non-native species that eats birds. In the absence of birds, spiders are now 40 times more abundant because, of course, the birds eat the spiders. So you get a real idea of what it's like to walk through a forest in Guam with all of those spider webs. In Madagascar, our colleague Amy Dunham's work has shown that large-scale extinctions and population reductions of lemurs have left trees without their primary seed dispersers. So it's now unclear whether the trees that are alive will actually be able to generate, regenerate without them. 
So removing species, by definition, decreases diversity. But removing certain species, what we call keystone species, leads to a breakdown of the ecosystem, and a breakdown of the ecosystem functions that can threaten the entire system through a series of what we call trophic cascades. So we need to continue this type of work and to expand it if we want to better understand how ecological communities work, to figure out what the consequences might be of ecological decay, and to develop ways to prevent further loss and to mitigate the impact of losses that we can't avoid. Now, this requires not only ecologists, but a wide range of scholars that can understand and address these issues from diverse perspectives. And this is where we're quite lucky here at Rice, because we're actually in a very good position to do exactly this. It turns out we already have a community of scholars that are conducting environmental research. And as you can see from this slide, that community spans pretty much all of campus. Starting this last summer, this community has been mobilizing. We're already taking the first steps to needed to come together and to work synergistically. But I would argue to solve these problems, we need more than just research. We also have to train the next generation. We not only need to provide them with the knowledge and the skills that they'll need to pick up where we've left off, but we have to inspire them to recognize why it's important to do so. And part of the problem with this is a phenomenon that we call shifting baselines. And we tend to accept the world as we experience it as normal. So the first time that we visit any particular ecosystem, like when I take students in my class into a tropical rainforest for the first time, they tend to assume that this is what a rainforest is supposed to look like. So it's hard to know if something is missing. So for example, if we don't happen to see many frogs, does that mean that they just don't belong there? Does it maybe indicate that the wet season is late in coming this year? Or does it mean that they've become locally extinct? We have a responsibility to teach the next generation of scientists to see today's ecosystems in their appropriate context as places where biodiversity has already declined and where it will continue to decline unless we intervene. The last few weeks we've seen that the youth of the world are already keenly aware of the threat that climate change poses to their future. The climate strikes led by teenage activist Greta Thunberg have shown us that the next generation expects us to take action to prevent an ecological apocalypse. History will judge us by what we do now. Thank you. So the question is, what is going to kill us first? I'll give you a third option. Um, I had a moment of apocalypse yesterday. I prepared the presentation on Monday night. And yesterday I opened my machine to make a final pass, and I couldn't find it. To me, that was the apocalypse. <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 1, 126. And God said, let us make men in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth over the earth. I love this creeping thing that creepeth over the earth. So for many, many millennia, this was the world. We have some shiny lights in the sky. We have the moon and the sun, but this was the world. And we were the apex of creation. It felt pretty good. And then what happened just over the past few hundred years? We have learned that we live on some insignificant planet of in rotating around an insignificant star in an insig insignificant galaxy and we descended for apes. But still, we had one thing to, we felt really good about. We were the smartest guy in the room, so to speak. 
We were the smartest. So yes, okay, but at least we are the smartest. And this all started to change in 1946. 1946, the ENIAC at University of Pennsylvania is being turned on. The story is that uh, it was using so much power that life in Philadelphia dimmed when it was first turned on. What we see here is Betty Jennings and Francis Villas programming the ENIAC, programming then what write, was not writing code by setting switches and connecting cables. It required an immense level of precision and exactitude, and the perception was only women has it, have it. So all the programmers were women, and only later programming become easy, and then men took over. <laughs> now, a person that played a key role, not in the ENIAC, but in the continuing uh, uh, computing revolution, was John von Neumann. John von Neumann is the foremost mathematician of the 20th century, by far. And uh, the project manager for the ENIAC, a Navy guy, happens to run into him in a train station in Aberdeen, Maryland. And, oh my God, this is John von Neumann. He goes introduce himself, and John von Neumann says, what are you doing? And he described to him the, the, the project, the ENIAC project, and he says, I want in. And nobody could tell John von Neumann, no, you cannot go in. So he became an important figure in the ongoing computing revolution. And he said in 1945, what we are creating now, this is 1945, the ENIAC has not even been turned on yet. He says what we are creating now is a monster whose influence is going to change history provided there is any history left. He died in the, in the 1950s. I'll come back to him. So as soon as we have intelligent machine, the question we face is, and we see that we have one generation, the next generation, and computers are getting better and better. So the first question is, if computers get smarter and smarter, will they not be eventually as smart at least as us? And this question, can we have intelligent machine, was first pursued by 1950 by Alan Mathison Turing, one of the, uh, another pioneer and, and, uh, and a founding figure for computer science. And in 1950, he wrote an incredibly influential article, Computing Machinery in Intelligence. If you heard of the Turing test and the imitation game, you've seen the movie, it's all based on this article. And the crux of the paper is it's a philosophical paper. It appeared in, in a journal Mind. And it asked, can machine be intelligent? And Turing answered decisively yes, compellingly yes. He goes against all the objections against intelligent machinery and demolishes them in a very convincing way, one after the other. And he concludes, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of, of uh, words and general education opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machine thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Maybe he was a little over-optimistic because the end of the century has come and gone. And is this laptop thinking? Well, we can debate it. But, Clearly, machines are getting more and more intelligence, and therefore it leads us to the second question. If they continue to get more and more intelligent, will they not eventually become smarter than us? Smarter than us. And this has been a, mot a, 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 a motif for many, many movies. Who recognizes this particular picture? Who is this? HAL 9000. Everybody knows who is HAL 9000. And one of the most memorable, line, memorable lines in movies, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I cannot do that. So just to remind people who have not seen the movie that uh, faced with the prospect of disconnection, HAL decides to kill the astronauts in order to protect and continue its program directive, self-preservation. Well, as we know from the movie, then the humans were smarter and Dave was able to outsmart HAL and get back into the spaceship and disconnect Hull. But that's not the end. There are many more movies. Who is this guy? Terminator. So now we have a new evil monster. Now this is Skynet. Skynet gained self-awareness after it has spread into millions of computer servers all across the world. This is from the movie. This is not a historical description. 
And then, in the interest of self-preservation, Skynet concludes that, uh, concluded that humanity would attempt to destroy it and impede its ability of safeguarding the world. So the solution is destroy humanities. So this is in science fiction. Now let's go back to the term the singularity which you may have heard. So this based on really on a mathematical concept, but one way to illustrate it, if you think what happened in a black hole, where you have big enough, you have a star that dies and it collapses on itself, and at some point it just keeps collapsing, collapsing, and it creates essentially a black hole which is kind of infinite density matter. So uh, the term singularity comes, the same thing happens if you try to divide one by zero, you kind of get infinity, and this is what we call in, in analysis the singularity. But it is now being used in a different way, in particular the concept of technical singularity, which is a hypothetical point in the future. People debate when, when and if it will happen. When technological growth become uncontrollable and irreversible, resulting in, in unfathomable changes to human civilization. And here we go back to John von Neumann. John von Neumann died in 1957 at age 54 from bone cancer. And the mathematician Stanislaw Ulam wrote a, a, an article about a kind of a featuring his life. And he remembered a conversation with him where von Neumann talked about the ever accelerating progress of technology and changes in the model of human, in the mode of human life, which gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. So technology keeps, it goes very fast. We all feel that things are just racing. You know, if you think about the iPhone, it's just about a decade old. Think of how much it influences our life. Everybody here carries in her pocket a supercomputer. And this all happened just over a decade. So we seem to be heading into some kind of a singularity uh, speculated for Neumann. A, a more specific interpretation for, for this singularity is other thing people call intelligent explosions. And this is due to Isaiah Good, who was a statistician who actually worked with Alan Turing in Bletchley Park during World War II. And he wrote in 1960, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can surpass all of the intellectual activity of any man, however clever, and woman. Since the design of machines is one of these intelligent activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design in even better machines, which tends unquestionably lead to an intelligent explosion. You have an intelligent machine, who build more intelligent machine, who build more intelligent machine, and we get this explosion, we get this singularity, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. So this is this kind of scenario where machines reach our level, then surpass it, and then surpass it, and then surpass it. You know, we talk about insects, but you still have some insects. And when I say, when I say cockroach in my home, I am confessing I'm not full of compassion to this form of life. I step on it. And partly because it is so such primitive that I don't really have much respect for it. What will happen if we as human beings are viewed like cockroaches for some super duper hyper intelligent machine? Could it happen? Should it happen? What should we do about it now? Thank you very much. I think I'm going to quit and go home and hide <laughs> under my bed. Uh, I'd like to open this up for about 15 minutes or so for if there are any general questions. Otherwise, we'll skip right to um, uh, the reception, and you can ask questions directly of each of the speakers. Do I have a first question? This is a little more for Scott. So if you think about a lot of people working on trying to preserve what we have, um, so what is two to three billion more people? do to that plan? Yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't specifically talk about human population growth. Of course, there's a lot of ways to take this uh, topic and very limited time. But yeah, I think underlying everything that I was talking about in terms of the motivating 
factors is, um, is, is human population pressure. We're at seven and a half billion. Uh, doubling has been happening faster and faster, especially in the last century. Uh, the rate of population growth is slowing, but the population is still growing. And so we have to consider what, you know, what does uh, population pressure look like with eight, nine, perhaps more billion humans. Um, I think that's the, the, you know, that's the inevitable future, right? So we're not going to have a future anytime soon with far fewer humans. It's at least this many and likely many more. So I think that's the, that's the challenge is trying to understand, um, you know, th these types of things I was talking about with biodiversity loss. That's, it's an inevitability. So how do we mitigate those losses? How do we, you know, find ways that each of us has less of an impact perhaps on, um, on natural ecosystems or reduces our, our demand? Uh, Moshe, I'm wondering if the idea of the super intelligent machine is not the right model. So let me think of a different model, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had an emperor who basically enslaved millions of people to keep them, uh, in, you know, to, to build his empire and keep them strong. So what if we think of the, the internet as the intelligent machine, which has now enslaved millions of people, who didn't, whose entire job is to keep the internet running. And uh, the thing is, it's now indestructible, it's worldwide, and we'll never escape from it. The internet will never go away, and it already is. And, you know, if you look at all the kind of blogs that just seem to come out of nowhere, they're really creations of the internet. And so, what about that? It's not going to kill people, it's simply going to enslave them all. So just change how you spell internet. Let's replace inter by SKY. <laughs> so we're doomed. Well, Sarah Connors may save us. M Mateus is for you. Uh, the, uh, the, the, Religiosity is being declined in America, right? The rise of the nuns, the evangelical movement is, is getting smaller rather than larger. What are the implications of that for the kind of issues that you've been looking at? I think that's true in the United States. It's certainly not true in other parts of the world, right? In Africa, we see the exact opposite. So I think it's just a matter of relocating. It's true in the United States that numbers of evangelicals go down, as is true for mainline Christians, it's true for Jews, all organized religion. But I think it's going down slowly, not in dramatic numbers. And as I said, what we see in other parts of the world, particularly in Asia and Africa, is that the numbers are going up quite dramatically, especially among Pentecostal groups and so on. So I think what we're seeing is just a relocation of the same problem, but the problem will not go away. It will not affect us very much. So Scott, are you a hopeful person? <laughs> and, no, I guess this ties also into something Matthias was saying. I mean, you know, I think there are an awful lot of people where if you showed them your talk, they would be scared and horrified and, 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 and want to do something positive, but you know, do you feel that there is a chance that we that enough people will decide that we should really worry about this, that it will make a difference, or are we, you know, we're kind of on a road with no turns at this point? Yeah, that's an important question. I mean, I guess I wouldn't do what I do if I wasn't a hopeful person, right? And I and I and I very much believe in the the power of of change, and not just for us, but for for future generations. And that's why I think education is so critical. Um, you know, I mean, there is a there's a, a hopeful part of this that has sort of a dark twist to it, and the hopeful part of it is, um, you know, nature is going to be just fine, right? I mean, I, I I was struck by this recently. We had um, uh, an opportunity to look at the impact. I study ants, right? The impact on ants of the flooding from Hurricane Harvey, and um, and you know, sort of expected that we would be able to observe something really unusual. Like we, you know, suspect that these rare major events have these huge influences on ecological communities, but we never get to study them because you're never in the right place at the right time, and here we actually were. So we went out and we sampled these populations of ants that we had been looking at before Harvey, and it turns out it's still preliminary, so don't quote me on this, but so far it looks like the impact has been almost zero. 
You know, these communities are just incredibly resilient, uh, even in the face of a you know thousand-year flood event, supposedly. Um, so you know, nature will be fine. The question is, will we be able to to survive along with it? And you know, and that's where I I, I just I guess I am a hopeful person, and so I. I you know, uh, put my money on on the the next generation and the ones that that come after it that they can uh, you know do a better job than we're doing. I put my money on the students. Yeah, exactly. All right, I uh, join me in thanking our three speakers. It was much fun.